<laughs> hey you guys, so in a strange, strange turn of events, I now have two knitting machines. So for somebody who has been knitting since I was 10 years old, and I love knitting, I did not think that I was gonna love knitting this much. <laughs> Hey guys, welcome. My name is Felicia from Sweet Georgia and welcome to Taking Back Friday. This is a space where we come every Friday and we talk about something to do with craft and color. I talk about knitting and spinning and weaving and dyeing on this channel. Now, <laughs> I have been falling down a massive rabbit hole that is machine knitting. I did not think that this was ever going to happen. And so it's weird that I'm sitting here right now with two knitting machines talking to you about all of this kind of stuff. Um, a couple of months ago, I did acquire an LK150 knitting machine and I had recorded an entire video that I never released, but I recorded an entire video basically challenging myself and challenging you to consider whether or not there are any crafts that you just right off that you have a bit of a mental block against that you think oh i could never oh that craft i could never <laughs> i felt a little bit like that about machine knitting for a long time and and so i challenged myself with this very very simple simple knitting machine to try it to try to learn how it works and all of this is a little bit because i have a circular sock knitting machine on its way to me in probably about a month or so and one of the things that i have been thinking about is figuring out well how do knitting machines actually work because when the circular sock knitting machine comes am i going to know how all of it how these hooks work why are there so many hooks and how do the hooks actually make stitches and all of these kinds of things and so learning how a flatbed machine works, I think that I can translate a lot of that knowledge to the circular sock knitting machine. So that was the original premise of it. Also, because I'm trying to find other ways of knitting that don't require a lot of hands. So to just alleviate shoulder problems, neck issues, all of those kinds of things, is there a way that I can continue to knit and enjoy knitting without having to get my hands all cramped up or my arms sore and all that kind of stuff? Now you can see partly one of the reasons why I didn't release the video is because since that time, I have literally just been making this. I've just been making swatches and swatches and swatches and trying to figure out how a machine actually works. One of the first things that I thought about when I was thinking about machine knitting was I was questioning, can you do shaping on it? Can you do lace on it? Can you do garter stitch on it? Can you do ribbing on it? Can you do all of the things that I just take for granted with hand knitting? You know, with hand knitting, you just manipulate stitches as you need to, as they come. But with machine knitting, I've discovered that you can do all of these things. You can make ribbing, you can do shaping and increases and decreases. You can make lace patterns. You can do all sorts of things, but you have to sort of know ahead of time what you're going to do so that you can plan for it. It requires a completely different way of looking at garments and thinking about garment construction and fabric construction. So I had brought home a whole bunch of skeins of this mohair silk DK, uh, which is in that velvet Elvis colorway. I love this color and I wanted to make myself a sweater out of it. I'm gonna make the Worsted Boxy by Hohi. And so I initially, I started doing things like I started swatching, making a swatch to figure out how many stitches to cast on, how many, uh, well, how many rows to knit so that it's not too long or it's the right size, all of that kind of stuff. And when I first started making this pattern, um, I didn't know how to do things like cast on. <laughs> I didn't know how to do ribbing. Um, I didn't know how to do increases or decreases or anything like that. So I had planned on just knitting giant swaths of stockinette and then uh, picking up the stitches and then knitting the ribbing up by hand, um, knitting all the finishing by hand and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so you can see here what I what I have done with this first piece is that I just um, cast on with some waste yarn and then continued on to knit all of the stockinette and then added a little bit more waste yarn at the end. And the waste yarn 
is meant so that I can go and pick up the stitches onto knitting needles and then finish the rest of the sweater. But obviously this is not long enough and I also made, I dropped a stitch in the middle and then when I picked it up I did a bad job of it and it looks really really bad. So this one is going to get unraveled and put back into a ball so that I can start again with this particular piece. But since I made this piece I learned how to do some other things. So I learned how to do a cast on so I wouldn't need to use waste yarn at the start. And then I also learned how to do ribbing by hand, you know, unraveling each stitch and then looping it back up with a latch hook tool in order to create the ribbing effect. So this is the one by one ribbing at the bottom of the sweater. And then I calculated how many rows I needed to make. And then this is, at, this is we're getting to the top of the sweater now and I'm so proud of myself. I figured out how to set up the knitting machine so that I could just knit part of the part of the row, but not the entire row. So I used some waste yarn to knit the center of the row, and then this is where it's casting off for uh, the neckline. So this is the, the front neck of the sweater. And then what I did was I actually took the two side pieces and I pulled them off of the machine and then I put them onto knitting needles. So this is one side and this is the other side. Oops, the stitches are coming out. So this is one side and this is the other side and they're on two separate circular needles. And so what I'm gonna do with these is I'm gonna put them onto the correct size knitting needles, the circular knitting needles, and then I will knit off the shoulder part of the sweater and finish the shoulder shaping for the sweater um, and then I'm gonna knit the back piece the same way and then finish off the, um, the back shoulder as well. Um, and then they get seamed together. I think it was a three needle bind off for the top of the shoulder seam. Then I'm gonna hang the sweater back onto the, the machine and then knit the sleeves. The only reason why I took it off in order to do the shoulder shaping is because for Hohe's pattern, there's a bit of a garter rib um, that happens at the end. So there's a garter ridge that happens on the shoulder of the sweater. Sweater. and knitting garter stitch on a knitting machine is very difficult. <laughs> so you can get an accessory for a knitting machine in order to knit garter stitch, but the LK150 does not come with such an attachment. And I, I think that the ones that I could find were all sold out. So in any case, I can't get that. So I just decided to pull it off the machine and then finish it by hand. So that is this sweater. And so learning that the LK150 did not have a ribbing attachment um, available, like they just, it doesn't exist. You cannot get a ribbing attachment for the LK150. And so it was always kind of churning in my mind. Like I want to be able to make fabric that has textures and knits and pearls and all sorts of things like that. That's not just stockinette and does not require a ton of hand manipulation in order to do. I really wanted, um, a more advanced knitting machine. And so <laughs> as it so happens, Charlotte sent me a listing on Facebook Marketplace for a vintage knitting machine. She's like, oh, check this out. There's this knitting machine on Facebook Marketplace. And so I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole looking at knitting machines and it just so happens that the exact model of machine that I was looking for, which is the Silver Reed SK280, I wanted one that was purely mechanical. I didn't want one that was electronic or anything like that, just purely mechanical, SK280, with the ribbing attachment, with a lace carriage. All of this stuff was available on Facebook Marketplace. Somebody was selling it and they lived two minutes away from my house. I don't even know how that's possible. But in any case, um, I picked it up and I cleaned it all off. I watched a couple of videos by Heidi Hennessy, who has a knitting machine school. You can find a lot of her videos on YouTube as well. And so I watched her video on how to clean the machine. So I cleaned the whole thing. I oiled the whole thing. I have set up the machine with the ribbing attachment down here. I haven't actually learned how to use the ribbing attachment yet. So that's the next step. I'm gonna learn how to use the ribber. Um, but with that ribber, I can do all sorts of crazy things now. Like rather than just knitting back and forth, Forth on this knitting machine, I can now knit once on the knitter and then once on the river and once on the knitter. And so I can actually <laughs> make a tube. I can knit a tube. I could also knit ribbing back and forth. So that's 
very exciting. <laughs> the other difference between the uh, LK150, which was a plastic machine, and this one, the Silver Reed SK280, is that this one is called a standard gauge machine and the other one is called a mid gauge machine. So the mid gauge knits things like worsted really, really well. So like this is a worsted weight yarn that the Superwash worsted and I put this on the LK150. It knits beautifully, really, really, really well. Um, love, I love this fabric. This is great. But the 280, this is a standard gauge machine. And so this one is more for finer weight yarns, fingering weight yarns, lace weight yarns, that kind of thing. So it knits everything at a tighter gauge. So all I have been knitting for the past couple of months, besides the, the actual body piece of that worsted boxy, is I've just been making like a million swatches. This is the swatch that I knit when I learned how to make ribbing for the first time. I, I did it in my dream and then I woke up and then I went to the machine and I did it immediately and I figured it out. <laughs> it's so awesome. This is my knitted swatch for Mohair Silk DK, trying to figure out what gauge to make that at. Um, I also put a whole bunch of different yarns on here. This is Harrisville Shetland and then I put some BFL and Silk Fine. This is a Superwash Worsted and then Flax and Silk Fine and just trying a whole bunch of different yarns at the same tension and the same stitch dials to see what happens. And what I basically need to do is I need to make myself a library of swatches. I need to make myself a library of gauge swatches. This is the first thing that I knit on this knitting machine, on this SK280. This is the first thing I made. I made this last night. I was so excited. <laughs> so excited. You have no idea how excited I am by this one tiny little swatch. Um, but this is BFL and Silk Fine. I'm like, I love this fabric. It's already been washed. It's been wet finished. I can feel this. I can measure this. Uh, I should probably make a bigger gauge swatch, but uh, it feels so good. And then this one again with the LK150, I tried something where I took two strands of the uh, Tough Love sock. So two strands of sock yarn and holding them together at the same time to knit because I thought maybe I could blend the colors together really well to make something new. But as you can see, one color is green and one color is kind of a coppery color, but it looks streaky and I don't like that. So now knowing that um, when you knit with a knitting machine, the two colors kind of stay in their own lanes as you knit them. Um, and so what I actually need to do is I need to pre-twist the two yarns together to make a very loosely plied new blended yarn. And then I will knit with that blended yarn. So luckily I have spinning wheels and uh, e-spinners and I can maybe just do this very quickly with an e-spinner, just make myself um, a twisted yarn before actually going and knitting with it on the knitting machine. But you can see here, I've practiced doing some increases. So, so there's a little increase, there's a little increase. Uh, figuring out how to cast off a little bit and then knit the rest of the way. And then I learned how to bind up. Yeah, I've just been practicing a lot of these little techniques and figuring out how do the transfer tools work? How do you do decreases? How do you do increases? All of this kind of stuff. It's been a really, fun learning experience. So now what I'm doing is because I do want to knit something with the flax and silk fine. I want to make myself a summer tee and I'm trying to figure out what gauge I need in order to make the sweater. So I have here, what I've made here is like a little tension swatch. You can barely see because it just looks like one big long strip of fabric, but in fact, it's got uh, markings all down the side here. So I know that down here I knit at the, with the stitch dial at six for size six. And then I loosened it up as I go up. And then the next section I did seven, the next section I did eight, the next section is nine. And then the last section here is at the 10. So turning the stitch dial to 10 to make a, the loosest fabric possible. And so now I have wet finished it and dried it. So now I can take the gauge measurements for each one of these sections and figure out, well, what settings do I need to use on the machine in order to create the gauge that I need? So this is the kind of thing that I'm going to do for all of the different yarns that I have. So this one is the first one is this flax and silk fine. And I just made one with the tough love sock as well. This is all just scrap yarn that I'm using scrap tough love sock. So at the bottom, I have it at the stitch dial at five and then six 
and then seven, this is eight, and that's nine, and then that's 10. So this one has not been washed yet. This has just come off of the, come off of the machine. So you can see it's just curling up on itself. It's quite firm still, but I think that once I wash it, it will loosen up quite a bit. Now, I think that what I really like about all of this is that I feel like I'm learning to knit from the very beginning again. I'm learning how to do an increase, learning how to do a decrease, learning how to cast on, how to cast off, like all of these basic, basic fundamental skills that I've just always taken for granted because I've known them for so long. Now I have to relearn how to knit from scratch and it's fun. <laughs> it's really actually really super fun. You know, all of those aha moments that you get as a new knitter, like when you first learn to cast on by yourself and you do your own long tail cast on, you don't have anybody else cast on for you. The first time you cast on, you're like, oh my gosh, I did it. Or the first time you like knit a couple of rows and you're making fabric. And the first time you're doing pearls, like all of these kinds of aha moments, I get to have all over again. It's, it's been so fun. <laughs> I mean, the, of course, there's been tons of mistakes. Like this, this entire pile is just mistakes. It's just putting things on, trying it, seeing if it works. And when it doesn't work, starting over again, over and over and over again. I, at one point in time, I knit an entire front piece of the sweater and then part of the side of the sweater, like six stitches dropped off of the machine. And then I tried to latch them all back up by hand and then it just looked like a giant mess. So I had to unravel all of that and start over from the beginning. <laughs> so I just think about my experience so far with these knitting machines over the past couple of months. It's been since March. So March, April, May, about three months of working with these knitting machines. And um, working with the LK150, I learned a lot of these skills and these techniques and everything like that. And then I used that and immediately was able to transfer it to this new to me machine. This machine is actually quite old. The person that I bought it from um, got it in Lithuania and then took it with her to Israel and then brought it with her to Canada. She had custom travel boxes made for these machines. So um, it's been really, really well taken care of. I feel incredibly, incredibly lucky to have um, found this and to be able to uh, use it. Now, the person who let go of it, she said that she wasn't knitting on it anymore because she couldn't see the stitches very well. And so she was continuing to knit by hand. So yeah, I feel very, very lucky that I'm able to use these two machines now. Now, I think that one of the things that people think about when they think about machine knitting is that machine knitting is like cheating <laughs> or that um, it's for product knitters, not process knitters, and that you're not getting a lot of the knitting process of making those individual stitches as you work. But I think just from my very, very limited experience so far, three months with these knitting machines, I don't feel like it is uh, necessarily product knitting because like, as you can see, I have no product. I, I'm just making swatches right now. Um, and so what I'm finding is that I'm enjoying the process. And part of the process is some hand manipulation at the knitting machine. You're using this latch tool or you're using these these transfer tools to manipulate stitches. So you are manipulating fabric, you are manipulating the stitches by hand. You're just doing it in a slightly different way. So I don't think that this is um, just cheating or anything like this because there is process involved. It is sort of meditative. It is sort of a slow, methodical process. One of the other points that I was thinking about is that I think that the reason why I am enjoying this machine knitting idea is because a lot of what you need to make on the machine, you have to think about ahead of time. You have to pre-plan and uh, you need to create these gauge swatches. You, it's almost like weaving <laughs> in some ways. This is where I feel like there's a lot of a crossover in terms of mindset or skills. When I'm weaving, I need to know what the set is beforehand. I need to know what ends per inch I'm going to use, what picks per inch I'm going to use, what weave structure I'm going to use. All of that I use to create calculations to determine how wide of a fabric I'm going to put onto the loom. And then all of those step-by-step -step processes is just very, very methodical. It's the same with a knitting machine. So 
I'm going to make my swatch ahead of time to know what the tension is going to be at. That's going to help me calculate how many stitches I need in order to cast onto the machine. And then once it's on there, I need to know where and when I need to do the shaping, how I'm going to do shaping, how I'm going to bind off. All of these things I have to think about ahead of time. And uh, I really, really enjoy that part, that pre-planning process. Who knew? Now, my whole goal here with making this video is not to convert you to knitting machines or switching away from hand knitting or anything like that. I love hand knitting and I will continue to do it as much as I can, but I also love being able to use a tool like this that helps me get further with things that I want to design. I have ideas in my mind of things that I want to make. And so if I can devise a way that I can design and then execute those kinds of designs quicker than hand knitting all of it, then then I feel like I'm getting further along with my design process, the things that I want to make, the things that I envision. So in any case, that's kind of where I'm going with that. But what I want to do with this video is just to challenge you to think about, are there crafts? Are there techniques? Are there things that are out there that you have sort of written off or you feel like I could never do that or I would never try that or anything like that? And just to keep a really open mind about all of the different things that could be out there that you might actually like. So if you've never tried spinning before and say, oh, I would never, <laughs> I could never, but then give it a try and see what you think. And then maybe you're making yarn that you would like to make into a sweater or something like that. I just want to stay open-minded for myself. I just want to stay open-minded to all the different things that we can do with yarn. So no doubt over the next couple of months, you're going to see me make more things on this machine. Hopefully, hopefully I will finish some things on the machine besides making swatches. Um, but I'm just really, really excited to learn more about how all of this works, how the river works, how the lace carriage works, just so many new things to learn. So I would love to hear from you if if you have fallen down the machine knitting rabbit hole, if you know how to use a machine, if you have a machine, if you've used one before, I feel like I'm looking for that knitting machine community and I'm not entirely sure where they're all at. I think I found like the circular sock knitting machine community, but I'm not sure what the flatbed knitting machine community is. And just really interested to meet more people who knit with a machine and know tons about them. So thank you so much for being here today to listen to me talk about knitting with knitting machines and yarn and all sorts of things like that. If you want to find me, we are on Instagram at Sweet Georgia. You can find our website, sweetgeorgiayarns.com. And of course, if you want to learn to knit, learn how to do some of these things, you can absolutely find us in the School of Sweet Georgia. It is schoolofsweetgeorgia.com. We have knitting classes there. We have dyeing classes. If you want to learn any of the things to do with fiber arts, you can find us there. So thank you so much for being here, and I will see you in the next one. All right, bye for now.